So I think we will get started because we've got lots of you here and it's almost 10 past six. So let's just get going. Um, so first of all, I just want to kick off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Catherine Woodfine. I'm the author of the Sinclair's Mysteries and the Taylor and Rose Secret Agent books, as well as this new book, A Dancer's Dream. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to talk to the wonderful creators of a very, very special book, Where Snow Angels Go, which as I'm sure you're all aware, is the indie book of the month for November. And I've got it here, and a very beautiful book it is too. So I will begin by introducing the author and illustrator. So Maggie O'Farrell is of course the author of the Sunday Times bestselling memoir, I Am, I Am, I Am and several novels for adults, including Hamlet, which won the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction, and Where Snow Angels Go is her first book for children. And we're also joined by Daniela Yaglenka Terracini, who's an illustrator, whose work you will recognise from books like The Night I Met Father Christmas by Ben Miller, and The Seeing Stitch. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to begin by asking Maggie and Daniela a few questions. We're going to have a reading and some live drawing from Daniela. And of course, there will be a chance for you to ask your questions as well. So please do feel free to pop them into the Q&A at any time during the event, and we will come back to them later. So I wanted to start by, first of all, asking you, Maggie, to tell us a little bit about the story behind this book, because there is quite an unusual story behind how it's originated. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, The Snow Angel, as a character, is someone that I made up. Um, as part of a story for my own children. And actually, he originated for the very first time, or should I say manifested maybe, um, in the back of an ambulance when one of my children was very, very ill and she was in anaphylactic shock and we were rushing to hospital. And one of the symptoms of anaphylactic shock, which people don't always know about, is that you get really, really cold, freezing cold, and your teeth start chattering because your blood pressure is dropping. And my daughter was very frightened by this. And I said to her, just out of the blue, I said, it's OK, don't worry. Uh, you're cold because um, um, there's a snow angel right behind you and he's wrapping his wings around you. And she just really liked this image and it was quite reassuring for her. And so they all asked for more stories about him and more they would ask about what he was doing now, or where he might be. And we just talked about it more and more. And then I went on a book tour and I sent them a story. Uh, I sent every day, I, sent, I wrote them a letter with a little bit more of a story in it. And when I got back, my children said to me, um, oh, well, can you do the pictures? Because we, we want to know what he looks like. And I said, um, unfortunately not, because I can't draw to, if, I, if my life depended on it. So <laughs> this is where the wonderful Daniela came in because she has considerably more talent with drawing than I do. And is writing a children's book something that you'd always wanted to do? And was it a very, very different experience to writing a book for adults? Well, it's something I'd always thought about doing, but actually, you know, I, I, I was always a bit nervous of it, actually, because, you know, even if you can, can write a full-length novel for grown-ups, there's no guarantee that you can write for children, because, you know, it, it, it is a very particular skill, as you yourself know, Catherine, <laughs> and, it, you know, it isn't necessarily transferable. So, I, you know, and, I, and obviously I, I, I've made up stories for my children for years, but it's not quite the same thing, but it's actually very useful having three guinea pigs in the house, because children... Children are very, will give you instant editorial feedback um, because you, you can read a story to them and if they're not really that interested, <laughs> they'll just get them and walk away. So, <laughs> and so you do get a kind of, you do get a sense you know, very quickly of whether or not the, the narrative is working. I was really struck when I was reading the book about the connection between it and your memoir and mm -hmm. um, in that it is the story that's about illness, it's about accidents, um, and I wondered how autobiographical was it? Are there any elements of it that were sort of drawn from your own childhood experiences or perhaps your children? I mean, you mentioned the, the ambulance story, but were there any others? Well, yes. I mean, there are parts of my childhood woven into the story and then there are parts of all three of my children, actually. And, and the first section where Sylvie is ill but doesn't realise it and the angel needs to go and wake the mother up. Um, it is actually based on something that happened to my son when he was four, he got meningitis and I didn't, we, we didn't know obviously, and I woke up about four or five in the morning 
And I just thought, for some reason, I, but I don't know why, I felt very cold and very sort of absolutely wide awake. And I thought, I need to go and check on my son. And I did, and he had a temperature of 42, and we needed to take him to hospital straight away. So, so, so there's all kinds of things that weave in and out. But one of the things that really surprised me, actually, during the story, um, when I was first looking at Daniela's pictures, is the one, um, halfway through, see if I can find it, of Sylvie sitting in the garden. And this is after she's been ill and she's recovering. And it gave me a real shock when I first saw it because... As you may know, if you've read the memoir, I was very ill as a child. And when I saw this picture, it gave me a real fright because there's an almost identical photograph of me, age eight, sitting in the garden in spring next to a table. And it's almost the same. And I thought, how did Daniela know? She's a clever woman in many ways. That's amazing. And leads me perfectly on to my next question, which is for Daniela, about your approach to creating the artwork for this story. Did you have a very clear sense straight away when you read Maggie's text of how you wanted these illustrations to look? Um, I don't usually start out with a master plan, but when I sit down and think about it, I, uh, I start to develop a sense of what direction I'd like to take. And I think mainly I've noticed, although my work is very detailed, in the last few years, I have tried to strip back and to make sure that I didn't add too much detail because I've realized that when you add too much detail, you don't leave enough space for the viewer's imagination to fill the image up with whatever they you know, feel that is right, which makes the image much more alive and it makes it work much more. So I think I had very much this direction in mind when I, uh, I was thinking of how I wanted to paint the illustrations for this book. I didn't want to overload them with details and I wanted them to be very atmospheric. And also because the story happened in, happens in the course of one year, I thought that um, it would be quite good to use a, a, almost like a color coding system to like mark the passage of time. So when you know Sylvie gets ill, it's winter and it's really cold and it's night time and it's all quite dark and blue and then she gets better and there's an explosion of green and then there's lots of mischiefs happening in the summer and then there's like the magic of Christmas coming back and I so I had that in mind as well so that's that's that was my general direction I guess. Yeah and that works so beautifully and um, as you're kind of leafing through the pages of the book and that sense of the changing seasons. But can you also tell us a little bit about how you create your artwork for anyone who's sort of interested in, in the process of how you make the images? Um, yeah, I, I think the first stage for me is always a lot of visual research because uh, my work is very rooted in reality. Um, it's not completely fantastic and whimsical, although I like illustrations that are completely whimsical that isn't never been my it's never been my style I've always wanted to create a parallel universe that is magical but you could almost believe that it actually exists and so in order to do so I I always want my characters to actually look real and uh, I can't completely imagine uh, a person's position you know like a, how, I can't draw purely out of my imagination I can't do it realistically and um and so i do a lot of visual research in this case i used models so, well in fact i um asked a, a family friend uh who somehow i thought her personality quite suited sylvie's i i felt that she she there was something that was in line with sylvie and um and i asked her to pose for me and i involved the whole family so that was the best thing i could have done because then i had um, not only a very inspiring model who was very patient with me, but also um, a coherent system so that the main character would look the same all through the book. Um, but I also look for reference for pretty much everything I do. So it's, it's um, how to draw a table, I will look at different tables and choose the best table for the story. And, uh, and it's also a great procrastination system because uh, I'm really scared of actually starting a drawing. <laughs> so I could like prolong that for a long time and then go around in circles, make hundreds of cups, cups of teas, and then eventually I take a deep breath and I actually start the drawing. And that's the technical side, which I enjoy a little bit less because it's a bit scarier. Um, and I have to think very much of composition and, and, and getting the drawing right. And, uh, and ultimately, if the drawing isn't right, then it doesn't matter how well I paint it it won't look right at the end. So that's a very important stage. 
And then when that's done, I um, I get to my favorite part of the job, which is to paint. And then I don't have to, yeah, I mean, it's scary, but uh, I get into the flow of it eventually and I don't have to think anymore. And I kind of access, you know, I use different parts of my brain, I think, for that stage, which is very enjoyable. And you work in watercolors, is that right? Yeah, ink. I do a bit of ink wash at the beginning of the work and um, uh, and then I use watercolor. Yes. And Maggie, how is the process for you of having kind of, you know, come up with this story and then working with Daniela and seeing her sort of bring it to life in, in the book? Well, it was it was absolutely magical, actually. And it's of course, it's the first time that I've ever collaborated with anyone, because, you know, when you write you know, a full full length novels for grown ups. It's just you. It's just you and your page. And you know, for two years, you 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 talk to your imaginary friends, and, and you hope they talk back to you. But with this, it felt like much more of an exchange and a conversation between me and Daniela. And one of the things I found really interesting about the process of writing for children was not only did I feel that I needed to read the story aloud to myself so I could hear the rhythms and the cadence, which is not something I do for um, full length fiction, but I needed. But I realised that I needed to make Um, spaces or carve out sort of um, places in the narrative for Daniela to take the reins so you might notice if you read the book that there's somebody else besides Sylvie who knows about the snow angel and that's not apparent in the text it's something that children can discover for themselves but only by looking at Daniela's pictures so I really wanted there always to be a sort of exchange between the words that I wrote and the pictures that Daniela created and the two, you know, the, the sort of baton of the story passes between me and Daniela, hopefully without too much, uh, sort of seamlessly. It absolutely does. And I think that really is one of the great joys uh, as a writer of writing books for this age group is that the pleasure that it is to work with illustrators and sort of see them bring your words to life in, in new ways and, and add more and, and fill in those yeah. spaces. Um, it really is a, an absolute treat. I think that's probably a perfect moment for us to have a little reading now. And Daniela, I think you're going to do a little bit of live sketching for us as well. Okay, are you ready, Daniela? I'm ready. I am. Perfect. So this is from right at the start of the book. Have you ever woken suddenly in the middle of the night without knowing why. Once, and not too long ago, this happened to a girl. Her eyes sprang open without warning and she looked around her. The walls of her room were pulsing with a strange glimmering light. The curtains were moving ever so slightly as if something or someone had recently passed through them. And was it the girl's imagination or was the room colder than normal? Could that be a line of frost along the mantelpiece across the shelf? Then the girl, whose name was Sylvie, saw something that made the blood freeze in her veins, made her heart leap like a fish in her chest. There could be no mistake. Someone was tiptoeing across the floor. His outline shimmered with a moonlight glow, his skin a strange blue-white. Most incredible by far was what extended from his back. A pair of wings, enormous inside, and made of the softest snow-white feathers imaginable. He was picking his way through the room, muttering to himself, wings wafting behind him. First saves a person, Hilby could hear him say, then fly down, no, that's not right, no, hang on, Um, first fly down, second find a person, third, he shook his head muddled, shutting his eyes as if for inspiration. Now what comes third? I've forgotten and I really... Sylvie drew in a breath, she let it out. She drew in another and said in a hoarse voice, Excuse me? The visitor whipped round, letting out a shriek, as if he'd accidentally trodden on something sharp. Heavens, he said, clutching at his chest. You scared me. I was just... He stopped and took a sideways step towards the end of her bed. There was a short pause. He stared at her with big, frightened eyes. You can see me, he whispered, incredulous. Sylvie nodded, looking up at him, holding the covers very tightly. The visitor seemed utterly confused. He opened his mouth as if he might speak, then he shut it again. He waved a hand up and down in front of his face, watching it so closely that he looked cross-eyed for a moment. Are you sure? I mean, I can see me, but can you? Sylvie laughed. She couldn't help herself. 
Of course I can. I'm talking to you, aren't I? He let his hands fall to his sides. Oh, dear, he said, in the saddest voice Sylvie had ever heard, his head hanging down dejectedly. Oh, no. I must have made a mistake. I'm going to be in so much trouble. This is my first flight, you see, and I did want it to go well. I've no idea what I did wrong. I'm sure you didn't do anything wrong, Sylvie said kindly. He did seem very upset. But you're not supposed to be able to see me, he cried in despair. And here you are, he gestured at her, seeing me. I tried so hard. I thought I'd done everything right, but... He paused to let out an enormous misty sigh. This isn't how it's meant to go at all. How is it meant to go, Sylvie said. Well, he said, lowering himself down to a chair at Sylvie's desk. I fly down to find you. And I'm invisible, entirely invisible, while I save you. And then, save me, Sylvie said, from what? And then she uttered a question she'd been wanting to ask all along. Who are you? He looked at the desk for a moment. He looked at the window. He looked at the row of wooden animals along the sill. He looked all around the room and then back at Sylvie. I'm probably not even supposed to tell you, and, he said, it's a long story. He got up off Sylvie's chair and stretched. It was an astonishing sight. Sylvie had been told never to stare at people, but she couldn't help herself. His limbs were silvery blue and his skin under his thin white robe seemed lit from within. His hair was sculpted curls of ice and when he moved, tiny showers of luminous dust came off him like snow falling off a branch. He took two steps towards the bed and his wings flexed out on either side of him. I am, he said, from the foot of her bed, your snow angel. My what? Sylvie said. Snow angel, he repeated. Snow what? Snow, he said slowly, giving the word two syllables, angel. Are you hard of hearing? Because I'm not hard of hearing, Sylvie exclaimed. I've just never heard of a snow angel. Not true, the snow angel said, folding his arms. Sylvie drew herself up as much as is possible while is lying in bed. It is true, she said. I've never heard of such a thing, and what's more? But you made me, the angel said, his feathers ruffling and twitching. I did not. I, I can't have, Sylvie stammered. But at the same time, her mind was working, whirring, taking her back, all the way back to last winter, to a day so silent it was as if a blanket had fallen over the world. A blizzard had blown through overnight and covered everything in cold whiteness. Sylvie, in bed, recalled a moment when she was leaning back in the snow, sweeping her arms and legs through its cold powder, back and forth, back and forth. There were flakes on her eyelashes and on her lips, and she was laughing. Sylvie gazed at the angel at the end of her bed. She looked all the way from the icy tip of his wings to his opalescent feet. That was you, she asked. The snow angel inclined his head. That was me. And when the snow melted the following day, you disappeared, Sylvie said. You were gone. Evaporated, the angel corrected, holding up a single finger. Not gone. I went up molecule by molecule into the air to gather in the clouds. Once you make an angel in the snow, he said, it is yours forever. We never disappear. We watch over you the whole time and come back whenever you need us. You watch over me. Yes, from a cloud in the sky. The angel tilted his head, more or less. But how? He shrugged. Things made of snow or water or ice are indestructible. If the sun comes out and dries us up, we just reform elsewhere in the atmosphere. You probably learned as much at school. It's simple science. So he giggled. Science? An angel I made last winter reappearing in my room is science? The angel looked affronted. Certainly. Do you doubt it? Sylvie so laced her hands together. It's not that I doubt it. I didn't mean to be rude. It just seems a bit more, a bit more like magic. Magic, the angel said as if he hated the word. Absolutely not. Do I look magic to you? Sylvie so examined his celestial robes, his illuminated outline, his silver blue face, his enormous wings. Yes, she said, you do. The angel sighed and ran a distracted hand through his curls. Look, we're getting sidetracked here, he said. I really had no idea that you'd be so talkative. All this science and magic stuff is beside the point when the point is, the point is, 
He looked around himself wildly, as if trying to remember what he was doing here in a house in the middle of the night. Then he lifted his chin, he straightened his robes, he cleared his throat. The point is, of course, that I am on a mission, my first one ever. I am here, he said, in an announcing sort of way, to help you. Sylvie gave a puzzled smile. But I'm fine. I don't need help. I'm at home in bed. I'm perfectly safe. Let's carry on chatting. Tell me more. What's it like up there in the sky? Why are you taller than the angel I made? Did the simple signs make you stretch? Why do, what do you do all the time? Are there others like you? Are you all friends? The angel didn't seem to hear these questions. He was chewing his lip, looking at Sylvie very intently. He walked one way round the bed, then the other. He leaned in very close. He drew back. He leaned in again. You're not entirely safe, he said eventually. I'm not. He shook his head. I wouldn't be here if you were. Snow angels, he said with a hint of pride, never make mistakes. At least not about this sort of thing. I think perhaps you're not very well. Really, said Sylvie. I feel fine. Hmm. You might feel fine, but you're not. He passed his hands through the air above her. Glittering snow dust showered down from him, falling onto her soft as swans down. Sylvie lay in her bed and watched as her snow angel stood above her, wings aloft, his face alert and concerned, his hands moving to and fro. Sylvie reached up and took one of them. His fingers were cool and strong as marble. She found she wanted to place them on her forehead just to feel them there, and so she did. There was a, a distinct fizzling sound as cold palm met hot brow. Aha, he murmured. I knew it. I knew you weren't well. You have a fever. Sylvie blinked underneath the hand. I'm going to have to wake up your mother. She'll know what to do. He moved on his silent white feet towards the door. Snow Angel, Sylvie whispered. Are you coming back? He smiled for the first time. I never go away, he said. In the morning, you won't remember any of this. That's the way things are with Snow Angels. You never see us. You never remember us. Or if you do, you'll just think you had a strange dream. But I'll always be here, watching out for you. Sophie saw him leave, saw him pass through the doorway, saw the bluish, lustrous glow fade. In the other room, Sylvie's mum woke with a start. She lay there for a moment, wondering what might have woken her and why the room was so cold. Then she thought, I'll just go and check on Sylvie. And that's the end of chapter one. That was perfect. Thank you so much. And Daniela, it was amazing to see your artwork kind of just growing across the page and there it is oh, he's so beautiful fantastic that's fantastic i think i think that was one of the first sketches i saw wasn't it daniela that's right i thought you know that was quite, it's just a, such a sweet moment when he's like what am i here to do i thought it'd be really nice to draw that and since he didn't make the final cut for the book i thought it'd be nice to show it to him absolutely and I think um, it was actually really lovely hearing that reading then, um, because one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Maggie, is um, I heard you talk on Women's Hour yesterday about reading with your children and how you've kept on reading with them, even as they've got older and they're able to read on their own, which is something that, you know, I think is fantastic and couldn't agree more about how lovely that is to do. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and why you love reading with your children so much. Well, I feel very passionately, actually, that we should carry on as parents and carers or grandparents or whatever we are. Um, we should all carry on for as long as we can reading to the child you know, or the children in our lives. Uh, I don't see I don't see the reason, you know, why just because a child can read on their own, you suddenly cast them off and say, right, off you go. I mean, I think obviously I'm not saying that, you know, children shouldn't read on their own because I really think they should. Everybody needs that space. But also I think we need to you know, maintain the very, very special um, shared bubble, if you like, that you can be inside, you know, when you and a child are sharing a story, are inhabiting the same space, are going through the wardrobe into Nadia, are falling down the rabbit hole together into or wherever it is, you're following a detective, you're jumping over rooftops in Paris, you know, any of these things, you know, if you're sharing that with a child, it's so magical. And why would anyone relinquish that you know I we still my husband and I still read to our 11 year old every day um sometimes the same book that she's reading on her own and then we'll read a chapter um to her or sometimes a different book 
Um, you know, I don't actually often read to my 17 year old anymore, it has to be said, mostly because he goes to bed after me now. But, you know, there was a time, there was a time a couple of months ago when he came down with shingles, which was a pretty miserable illness, and he was very not happy and he had a fever. And there was one day when he just couldn't, he was just miserable and couldn't kind of settle. And so I read him a short story by uh, Saki. Um, all about a really murderous ferret. It's a great story. But it, it was an amazing, it was sort of an amazing return actually to me and him when he was much smaller. And I think he was soothed and I was soothed. And it was, it was a very magical moment actually, which I still hold on to. So, I mean, I think, you know, adults should read to each other. We should all read, you know, there's, there's, it's something very different. It's a very different experience to actually reading the books on the page, to hearing the words, especially from a voice of someone you love. So please, everybody keep going, keep going with the reading. That's given us all something to do this evening. Once we finished here, we'll all be going off to read, <laughs> read with our family. Um, but I wanted to ask you both a little bit as well about your own memories of childhood reading and the sort of role that books played in your childhood. Um, Daniela, were, were you a big reader when you, when you were growing up? Were there particular books that you sort of fondly remember from your childhood? Uh, no, I was not a big reader. My, none of my family was. And, um, and I, it feels like my childhood was so long ago. I just, I remember reading, re, you know, I remember being read to um, the old classic European folk tales and like the writing books and the writing. Which I knew about that. And I uh, obviously loved the illustrations. But I didn't actually discover when I was reading 16, like for myself. Um, and yeah. And was quite. I guess I was quite sad that I'd missed out on so many years of reading. Um, but I do have one book uh, from my childhood that stands out, which um, you know, particularly for the art, which was uh, is is a book called Fairies, um, which is by um, Alan Lee and Galpo Fruit, which is you know, yeah, it's a very famous book. And uh, I think it probably did have quite a big influence on me because the the drawings are, of these creatures are completely magical and obviously not uh, realistic. And yet they're so rooted in reality, which is what I've been really fascinated by. And uh, and they're both kind of delicate and absolutely terrifying. Um, and yeah, so that's, if I think of my childhood books, that's the one that really stands out. And Maggie, what about you? Are there particular books that you remember with great fondness? Oh, so many actually. I mean, how long have you got, Catherine? We <laughs> I mean, I said, picture books I remember from my childhood really strongly are the one that was probably my most favourite was Where the Wild Things Are by Morris Sendak. There was something in a book about a child who was incredibly wayward and wild and ran absolute riot around a house and then got into trouble sent to the room. I don't know why that really spoke to me as a child. <laughs> <laughs> there may have been a certain, uh, you know, uh, sympathy that I felt with Max, and I still do actually. And I, I absolutely, you know, something like the Tiger Who Came to Tea, you know, I mean, it's and that book is absolutely perfect. There's not a word out of place. The illustrations are gorgeous, and you know, I remember when I, I was so excited when I had my son because I thought <laughs> I can read him all these books, and that was one of the first children's books I went out and bought because I thought I can't wait. And all my children, and I still know off by heart, there's that weird thing. And I still have, I still, whenever I think of it, I still say, when suddenly, bing bong, there was a ring, I still do the noises, actually. So those, I think there's, and I also, I love Beatrix Potter. And Beatrix Potter is somebody who I think is often, and she's often associated with a very kind of pretty English pastoral landscape. But actually, she's terrifying. I mean, probably her stories are so dark. I was so frightened of the tale of Samuel Whiskers, the one where Tom Kitten gets trussed up in all that string that I couldn't have that book in my room um, in, in when I was a child. I had to get my mum to take it out of the room before I could go to sleep. <laughs> when she kissed me goodnight, I said, is it, is it in the room? Is it in the room? Because I couldn't even bear the thought that that picture was in the same room as me as I was sleeping. Um, and then when I got a bit older, I loved um, the Moomins, um, as you know, evidenced by my mug. And I loved The Secret Garden. Uh, there's a book which I really love, which is out of print, which makes me so cross. It's called The Bears on Hemlock Mountain. Um, and I really, I think I'm, I'm going to start a one woman campaign to Penguin to please reissue it because it's so gorgeous uh, with amazing kind of woodcut drawings. And a, a writer called Wanda Gag, um, who is, I think she was of Eastern European extraction, but American. And she wrote very strange not, uh, books, which she also uh, illustrated herself. Anyway, so I should probably stop there. I mean, that's brilliant. You completely intrigued me because that's actually a children's book that I've not heard of. So mm. I'm writing that one down straight away. I'm going to be okay, chasing good. that one. I have a spare copy. I can send it to you, Catherine. <laughs> Even better. Pop in, get on it. We'll have it republished. Yeah, quickly in the text. Just hearing Maggie talking about the dark side of each other uh, uh, reminded me. I read somewhere that she used to stuff 
her own uh, her rabbits. <laughs> so that she could use them as models. So she would like each of That doesn't surprise me. Well, yeah, no, but I mean, obviously, it was a different time, so that would have been completely acceptable. But yeah, I wonder. I wonder maybe she, maybe she was basing the character of Mr. Todd on her. Isn't he the really terrifying badger who walks around with a sack full of baby rabbits? <laughs> Maybe. It's an interesting, interesting psychological double there. The dark side of Beatrix Potter. <laughs> it all comes out. Um, I wanted to, um, we're going we're gonna to open this up to ask, uh, let everybody else have a chance to ask some questions in a minute. And there's some really good ones coming in on the Q&A. So if anybody else has got anything they'd like to ask, please do pop them in there. Um, but just one more question from me first. I wanted to ask you both a little bit about books at Christmas time. There's something about this time of year that makes you really want to kind of cuddle up with a book with your children by yourself in front of the fire under a blanket. Um, and this this feels to me like exactly that sort of book that is going to come out at Christmas and be enjoyed by a family together. Are there particular books for you both that are those kind of Christmas reads that you always want to get out in the winter when, you know, the nights are long and the days are short and, and the dark's creeping in? Um, are there books that you want to revisit at this time of year? Daniela, what about you? Uh, yeah, I kind of thought about that question and I, um, um, I yeah, came up with three books. Uh, one of them is also one of my favourite illustrators, and that is this one. Um, it's Merry Christmas, Ernest and Celestine by Gabrielle Vincent or Vansan. And that it's a absolutely gorgeous stories about this the friendship between this pair and this uh, mouse. And they basically have no money. And uh, but they find somehow they go uh, as you can see in this illustration, they go and um just find bits of rubbish that they can use to make a, a Christmas party. And it's just uh, it's just beautiful and so uh Touching. I also very much love this uh, Benji Davis book, The, uh, the Stormwell in the Winter, which is just such a lovely book to read when you're cozy inside. And then the last book is uh, one of my favourite stories, which is a book I had um, the pleasure to work on, uh, which is The Night I Met Father Christmas by Ben Miller, which is uh, it's just such a wonderful, uh, funny uh, and warm Christmas story. So I think I will probably read that every Christmas. Lovely. Maggie, what about you? Have you got any Christmas winter favourites? Yes, absolutely. Well, we actually have a special box in the basement of books that only come out in December and then we put them back again in, in January. Um, and one of them would be Mog's uh, Christmas, which I do, you know, Judith Kerr's book about Mog and she falls down the chimney. And uh, I still remember my son just actually falling on the floor laughing with the line where, you know, the old aunts think that it's, it's Father Christmas who's come down the chimney. And they say, you know, Father Christmas doesn't have a tail. And, you know, at age three, that was the, the funniest joke he'd ever heard in his life. Um, I also love a book, um, which actually is about, it's about winter, but not Christmas, because I think it's, it's good to kind of open up to all sorts of different beliefs. My husband's Jewish, so we're always looking for stories that appeal to kind of ecumenical audience. Um, and it's called Extra Yarn. It's by Mac Barnett, and it's illustrated by John Classen. And it's such a fantastic book. The story is beautiful. It's all about a little girl who discovers a box and yarn will come out of it endlessly and it never, never stops. And she knits jumpers for all her friends and she knits things for the birds and then she carries on knitting and she knits covers for the trees and the houses and it goes, goes. And then, of course, an evil person arrives and an antagonist and tries to steal a box. It's just gorgeous. It looks gorgeous. It is gorgeous. It's a fantastic story. Um, what else is in my Christmas box? <sighs> oh, God, so many things. I mean, the Bears on Hamlet Mountain, that's also about a snowy mountain, the one I was just talking about. And now my mind's gone completely blank. Uh, I do also, I love reading uh, Philip Pullman's Grimm's Fairy Tales because often the, his versions are particularly wonderful, I think, and really get to the heart of what the stories are and what they mean. And those are, those are a pretty good winter read as well. Fantastic. Some lovely recommendations for everybody's winter bookshelf there. Um, I'm going to um, ask some of the questions that have come in from our audience now because there's some really nice ones here. Um, let's have a look. So this first one here is for Daniela and leads on very nicely actually from what we've just been talking about. And this is from Sarah at the Stenning Bookshop. And she says, your lovely illustrations capture the spirit of childhood so well and remind me of early 20th century illustrators like Jesse Wilcox Smith and Anne Anderson, as well as the more recent Shirley Hughes. Are you influenced by any particular illustrators? Yeah, I would say uh, that my main influences uh, for a long time it was Arthur Rackham and uh, Edmund Dulac. Um, 
they I just absolutely loved. I literally, I think I went after Rackham first, then I moved on to Edwin Dulac, and then there's someone, sorry, someone coming in. And um, and Kai Nielsen, I very much liked as well. Um, the patterns were just really lovely. And um, and also, <laughs> I and um, yeah, and I guess more recent authors that I very much like is uh, there's a woman called Elizabeth Swagger who's just absolutely brilliant, and then Gabrielle Vincent. So those are my main influences. But all the uh, illustrators of the Golden Age were, <laughs> yeah, are my influence basically. Lovely. And um, a question for you, Maggie, that's come from Mary Randall, and this goes back to what we were talking about, about reading aloud and, and the joy of um, reading with your children. She asked, um, do you think that some books are better read out loud? And if so, what would be your favourites? Oh, that is a hard one. I mean, I think there are certain rhyming books, as picture books, which, of course, are just, you know, fabulous to read. I mean, Michael Rosen, you know, could you impossibly improve on that? But I do think something like Morris Sendak has a, a kind of lyrical quality to it. And then when you get on a bit further um, for older children, I mean, Mr. Garmin is just fantastic to read aloud and to share with your family. You know, every single line is an absolute zinger. And it's, it's so, I mean, it, you know, his sentences are beautiful as well as being absolutely hilarious and surreal. Um, I remember also really loving, my son really loved Lemony Snicket. And those are fantastic to read aloud. It's a very kind of conversational prose. Those are wonderful um, my daughters in particular are huge fans of uh, Cresta Cowell uh, and her books are great as well. They're very good fun. And I have to say, uh, there's a really good writer called Catherine Woodfine and we've really enjoyed reading her books. Of her. I wish I could tell her this, you know, to her face. Uh, Catherine Rundle again is also, I mean, it's, you know, so many, so many things out there that are just, you know, always brilliant to read, uh, always brilliant to share. And I must say, from, from my point of view, there is absolutely nothing nicer than hearing that a whole family, uh, parents and children, mm. grandparents and children, whoever, have been enjoying the book together. And I think that's, you know, that's a really very special kind of experience to have. So it's always really lovely to hear that. So thank you. Um, Daniela, a question for you. This comes from the Kents. She says, they say, um, do you like drawing when you were at school? Oh, yeah, I draw. I, I draw all the time, right? especially when I was a school. I always uh, did a lot of drawing during lessons. I would draw caricature of my teachers and uh, portraits of the classmates next to me. Um, yeah, so I did a lot of it. Um, but I never, I, I didn't really um, think that uh, drawing was a possibility as a career until I was in my, I would say, early 20s, almost mid 20s. I, not, nobody in my family did anything like that for a living. I didn't know there was such a job as illustrator. I didn't think um, I was an artist. I didn't think, you know, I, the first time I remember thinking, actually, I think I would like to study painting. I felt a little bit like, oh, who do I think I am? You know, I'm not a painter. So, though I had a passion for drawing, I didn't really, um, yeah, I just... I, I don't want to mystify, that's what I mean. You know, I don't want to be like, oh yeah, I've always drawn all my life and therefore it makes sense that this is what I do. It wasn't like that. I, I very much liked the drawing, but it was just one of those things. And um, Daniela, you're a little bit quiet. I think we're losing your oh. volume slightly. That's great, thank you. And yeah. um, a lovely question here from Emma Carroll. I wonder if that's the Emma Carroll we know. And um, she says, hello, Maggie and Daniela. Can you each name one book that you'd like from Santa this year? Very nice question. Hmm. Oh, well, Daniela can go first while I have a think. <laughs> does Emma Carroll know Santa? That's the question. Is she, I mean, she I think she probably write, does. Write my, she probably does, actually. Write my letter to him. Um, hmm. No, I feel too much put on the spot. I'm going to have to pass on this one. <laughs> um, I think I would like, if I could have... A book, please, Emma, if you can sort it out with Santa. Um, about something about, I'd like something about travel and be able to look, because, you know, I'm, I do, I've got terribly itchy feet at the moment having to stay at home on site. I love to travel. And actually, at the moment, I'm desperate to go to Italy, uh, in particular Florence, please. So if I could have a book about Florence, that would be good. Maybe some pictures in the Uffizi Gallery. Um, that would be really nice. And also some novels to read on the way, because I'm planning to go <laughs> on the train <laughs> in my fantasy travels. Probably on a night train. So, uh, yeah, I'd like.
there's some books reading on the way. I, I quite like to read The Vanishing Half. That's the one I've been planning to read and I keep meaning to go and pick up at my local bookshop. So, yes, thank you so much, Emma. That's on my um, Christmas list as well. And Emma says, yes, it's me, but she doesn't answer the all-important question of whether she knows Father Christmas, so we'll just have to be, you know... She's keeping, playing best. her cards close to her chest. Fair she enough. Is. Um, a question from Melanie now. She says... Did you enjoy the discipline of having a limited word count as required for a picture book as opposed to the huge word count of an adult novel? Well, interestingly, you know, I think it wasn't really so much about word count, actually. And it was only because <laughs> I wrote the story. I mean, it's not not exactly as it is, but pretty much as it is um, before I even showed it to Walker Books. Um, so, and I always think that stories, it, I don't know, I, I, I actually have the word count function on my word processor completely switched off. I hate it and I find it really distracting because I think actually it's not that important. I mean, I do know there are some, you know, everybody, all writers have the different techniques and I know some writers who will write, however, you know, 2,000, 3,000 words a day and that's what they do and that's what works for them. But for me, I actually try not to think about it all the time because I just think that every every story will find its own shape just as water finds its own level. And I think some stories are going to be 5,000 words. Some stories are going to be, you know, <laughs> 2,000 words. Some are going to be hundred, you know, 120,000. And you never quite know. I mean, Ernest Hemingway said that the story he was proudest of in the whole, his whole of his career was six words long. I'm not going to tell you what it was because it's too sad for an event for children, but, <laughs> but it is an absolutely brilliant piece of writing. You could probably look it up if you want to. Um, so, you know, I think word counts not then put, you know, there are some stories that when you start writing them, you're not necessarily sure where they're going to end up, you know, and they, and they will assume their own form on the way. So I think you have to tr trust, you have to trust, trust the story and it, it'll find its shape and find its words. I think that's great advice. And you've just inspired me to turn off the word count on my current work. Oh, do it. Get rid of it. It's a tyranny. It's a terrible tyranny, the word count. Um, a question from Annie. She wants to know about how the two of you met and came together to work on this book. Now, I'm guessing that's probably something that came about via your publisher's Walker books. Um, is that the case, Daniela? How did you kind of come to work on this particular book? Uh, I think so. I mean, I think Maggie might know more, uh, but yeah, I was definitely approached by the publisher and uh, I guess it stayed a little bit of a mystery. It always stays a bit of a mystery to me who thought of me first. Um, and I kind of don't usually dare to ask because it seems a bit, I don't know, unnecessary and vain. Yeah, who thought of me? Um, but, you know, it, it kind of doesn't really matter. I was, uh, I was absolutely delighted. Well, I can tell you exactly how it happened. <laughs> So there was that we were talking with Walker um, about who would be good, and we were looking at various people, and 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 we were kind of looking at lots of different portfolios and online things. And then <laughs> there was one day when I was at home with my daughters, and we were we were just hanging out, and we were cutting out um, with scissors this little tiny thing called the fairy tale library. And we've got, and they're tiny, tiny books. And I'm really rubbish at things. Like, I'm terrible with my hands, and I'm really <laughs> fisted. And my daughter's doing a lot better job of it than me than I was. And as we were doing it, one of my daughters said, "I really like these pictures," and the other one said, "Yeah, she should, she should illustrate your book." And then we kind of turned <laughs> and on, on, and then I had to look at these. I had to get my glasses on and look at them, and I thought, oh, "They are right." And I looked, uh, I typed in Daniela's name into um, Google, and I just suddenly saw these images and it was I, I was so it was like a sort of lightning bolt moment and I was so excited because I thought this has got all the magic and all the kind of the light and the shade and the darkness and I felt that Danielle had very deep roots in European folk tales and I was so excited so I ran to my computer and typed in and said do you know Danielle <laughs> do you think we can meet her and then actually Danielle and I had a meeting they magically found Daniela and lured her into work at Walker's offices and we met on do you remember Danielle it was it was literally the hottest day I've known ever to London I mean it's something like 37 degrees something crazy and I was absolutely boiling and I struggled down to at uh, Vauxhall on and in, in this incredibly hot day and then we met and then I realized I was sitting opposite Daniela on a table the first time we'd ever met and I realized that she had some sketches and that she was about to push them across the table at me and I thought this is so high pressure what am I going to say if I hate them and I thought, I'm going to have to kind of keep my face in this kind of rictus <laughs> just in case. And I thought, she seems lovely. You know, I don't want to be mean to her. And I was so terrified. She's passed it up. And I thought, oh, God, please, please like them, please like them. And then I saw them and I thought, 
oh my god I absolutely adore them they're perfect they're so much more perfect than I ever could have imagined so it was perfect and I've always saying to people me and Daniela it's the best arranged marriage that I ever could have imagined <laughs> I'm so glad Annie that you asked that question because I feel like we've solved the mystery now for Daniela <laughs> and to my daughters my daughters chose Daniela <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. they were right now, a few people have asked um, the same question, which was actually a question on my list um, to ask you, Maggie, which is, are you going to write any more books for children? Would you like Well, to? I am, because this one is dedicated to one of my daughters and perfectly reasonably, my daughter wants one for her now. And so I am writing one, uh, which is will be dedicated to her at the moment. And I'm, a, I'm sort of, what am I on? I'm, I'm, I'm on draft about two or three. And it's not quite, it's not quite ready yet, but it will, but it will be soon. It's quite exciting. So I'm hoping that Daniela's not busy for the next <laughs> while. Just a heads up there, Daniela. <laughs> Don't put your brushes away yet. That also leads beautifully on to what I was going to ask you, Daniela, which is, can you give us any clues about what you're working on next? Uh, Apart from a new Maggie O'Farrell book, by the sounds of it. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I can't review all the details, but I, uh, I, yeah, I'm going to be working on a set of book covers uh, for, for children. And so that's very exciting. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, I'm afraid that we are almost out of time now. I'm very sorry to the few more questions that we haven't had chance to ask, but I think we've done most of them. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for that. Um, so really, all that's left for me to do is to say an absolutely massive thank you to Maggie and Daniela for giving us a wonderful insight into this beautiful book and the story behind it and how you both work. Um, it really has been a pleasure and thank you so much everybody for joining us it's not quite the same as all sitting around in a real bookshop where we could really see you and chat to you but we're really glad you're here um, just the same and thank you as well for all of your brilliant brilliant questions um, I just want to finish off by saying of course thank you to Mr B's Emporium to the Stenning Bookshop and to the Moon Lane Bookshops for hosting us this evening and of course if you haven't already done so please please do get your copy of this beautiful book from them it really does make a wonderful Christmas present and there is no one better to buy your Christmas gifts than independent bookshops this Christmas. They all need our support this month. So let's all get in there and buy some books. We've got some brilliant recommendations for this event. So I know I'm going to be off having a little look after this. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And I hope you will all really enjoy reading this beautiful book. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all so much. Bye. Bye.